Hi, everybody. My name is Jake, and I will be your host for today's event. Today, we're talking about AAV services. You are here today because you do R&D work in gene therapy, and you're looking to make a better vector, a better genetic payload, or support for making your vector more manufacturable. The name of the game today is AAV services. Now, and I'm going to, I want to let you in on a little behind the scenes conversation. We had a lot of back and forth over here on the Ginkgo virtual events team about whether we wanted to call this event AAV services or gene therapy services. Because of course, AAV is not the only way to deliver a gene therapy and optimizing the vector is not the only challenge in gene therapy. And at Ginkgo, we want to do all the challenges. We want to be end to end. We want to do it all. That's the point of the foundry model. It's the efficiency that comes from being able to get all your biotech R&D work done in one place. And we absolutely do work on the full stack of gene therapy R&D. It's soup to nuts, soup to nuts. And some of it we're going to cover today, and in particular, the payload engineering, where we optimize the DNA sequence that your AAV is going to deliver. That's something that Ginkgo is really good at. We decided to make AAV the star of the show today, mainly because we have some really good data on our AAV tech that we wanted to show off. Okay, so what are we doing today? We're going to start with a little introduction to Ginkgo's platform and our philosophy of AAV services. Basically, this is my pitch for Foundry Biotechnology. It's the way we do things here at Ginkgo. And what Ginkgo brings to AAV engineering that you can't get anywhere else. Then we're going to hear from our technical team on different aspects of our AAV offering. Uh, so for that, we're talking about capsid engineering. Almost everyone out there working with AAV is thinking about the same set of problems. You're thinking about immunogenicity. You're thinking about tissue tropism and manufacturability. We have some assets here that can already solve these issues in some cases. We also have the ability to engineer this capsid for your specific R&D goals. Then we're talking payload engineering. What is the typical wish list for a gene therapy payload? You want robust expression of your construct. You want cell type specific expression, minimize those off target effects and improve your safety profile. You might also want the expression to respond to an extracellular or an intracellular signal if that's part of your therapeutic mechanism. So this is fundamentally DNA programming problem, something that we're good at at Ginkgo. We're not afraid to say so. And then finally, we're going to end with a nice rich round of some Q&A. So we're really going to just get into it. We're getting into it today. And to that end, I'd like to call your attention to the Q&A feature that is on the bottom of your Zoom window. You can click on that Q&A button at any time, ask us a question. Could be a question on the technical side, like does Ginkgo offer AAV capsids that target my favorite tissue type? Could be a question on the business side, like how do I partner with Ginkgo? Ah, yes. Speaking of Ginkgo, Here's a little about Ginkgo. We are over 1,200 people. We are based in Boston. We have offices in California, France, Netherlands, Switzerland. If you come and visit our headquarters, you'll see a lot of robotics, a lot of automation. That's our foundry platform. So between the technology investments and the physical scale of the foundry, we've invested almost half a billion dollars in building it out. We didn't do that so that we could develop our own gene therapies. We did it for you so that we can partner with you to make those products. So we're capitalized to scale and that makes now a good time to partner with us. Good way to think about our business model is we're a CRO. We're a CRO. You can send us your R&D projects on a contract basis. So if you need to spend more, you can spend more. If you need to spend less, you can spend less. But we want to be more than a traditional CRO in the sense that you can come to us and get things that you can't get anywhere else. What kind of things? What can Ginkgo do for you in gene therapy R&D? Well, here's your menu. 
Here's your menu of options. All right, we've got capsids that are ready to go today. These are the Strive AAV capsids, highly validated. We'll be sharing some of that data today. We've got large libraries of partially characterized capsids that we can mine for new properties. We can improve your gene therapy payloads with things like stronger promoters, tissue specific promoters, or key structural elements like ITRs. And then finally, we can make your gene therapy products easier to manufacture. And for that, we're talking about high expression plasmids, we're talking about high yield cell lines or editing cell lines for better performance. The big unlock here is that you can get all these things from one service provider, from one foundry. We can execute multiple steps in your AAV R&D pipeline, and we can do each of them at the scale that it takes to succeed. So that's the half a billion dollars in foundry infrastructure. If you need to go big on gene therapy, we have as much capacity as you need, uh, or if you wanna spend less, you can spend less. Okay, good, that's my sales pitch. That's my sales pitch. Okay, done, done. Sales pitch over. Let's get to the tech. First up, we are talking capsid engineering with Kenan, Kenan Smith. Uh, Kenan Smith is a structural biologist with more than 10 years experience in biochemical and structural characterization of proteins. He has a PhD from the University of Florida, where he worked on the structural engineering of the AAV capsid for clinical applications. He went on to become the senior manager of caption engineering at Stride Bio. And now at Ginkgo, he's a senior mammalian engineer and he continues those efforts here at the foundry. Welcome, Kenan. Welcome, Kenan. Took me a second to find unmute. Thanks, Jake. Um, Hey, how's it going? I uh, appreciate the introduction. Uh, I'm very excited today to talk to you about the history of the Strive AV platform, uh, the breadth of resources obtained from these efforts, and how, as Jake mentioned, we view the future of work, uh, that work specifically continuing at Ginkgo. Uh, so while at Stride Bio, my colleagues and I built from our combined structural and functional understandings of the AV capsid um, in order to engineer vectors with enhanced escape from pre-existing neutralizing antibodies. Uh, pre-existing immunity being a major roadblock to uh, AAV gene therapies, uh, the hope here was to create a library of stealth vectors that are able to escape neutralization. Um, so working from this structural knowledge uh, and the antigenic footprint mapping that uh, Dr. Mavis Egbonji McKenna's lab was initially doing um, uh, on the surface of this capsid, uh, we developed a series of libraries that uh, were then leveraged at Stride Bio to develop its preclinical pipeline. Uh, uh, the fifth step here, the cross-species compatibility approach was added later on uh, in order to enrich these libraries through multiple uh, select species during the evolution process. Uh, and the idea here is that we want to de-risk preclinical development uh, as you move from animal model to animal model uh, and trying to help to ensure translatability in humans. Um, so as you might imagine, the, the regions involved in antibody neutralization overlap very heavily uh, with other functional regions of the capsid. Uh, so this leads Stride to generate a variety of promising capsids, uh, many of which aim to address the aforementioned uh, immunity challenge, uh, but also along the way uh, were modulated in other functional areas, such as uh, liver targeting, potency, and cell type specificity. Um, we're gonna talk about a couple of these select candidates today, but in addition to these, the platform also resulted uh, in a wealth of untapped library data uh, of evolved AAV capsid variants across the various tissues that were part of Stride Bio's AAV, our preclinical pipeline. Um, over here on the right, you can see how we imagine merging these two together, right? So Ginkgo is now uniquely positioned to take this platform even further. Uh, by combining the depth of this AAV structure function data that was at Stride, uh, along with Ginkgo's institutional capacity for bioinformatics, uh, machine learning, and uh, high throughput screening, in order to try and unlock enhanced capsid characteristics. Uh, so when we combine this uh, with regulatory element screening and Ginkgo's uh, successes in engineering other parts of AAV production and manufacturing, uh, we aim to enable the ambitions of all of our partners across the gene therapy space uh, and continually build upon and improve uh, this full stack AAV engineering platform. Uh, as Jake said, 
soup to nuts. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of these capsids that come from Stride and how Ginkgo is thinking about them. Uh, and they fall into three major buckets here. Uh, so on the left, we've got capsids in the first bucket, which have been extensively validated in large animal models, including NHPs. There's some pig data there as well. Uh, and these capsids are ready to go for partners to match to their desired indication or application. Uh, the second bucket here in the center, uh, this contains capsids with early validation data uh, that demonstrate differentiated profiles from their parental backgrounds. Uh, so this includes capsids with mouse data ready for biodistribution testing in NHPs, uh, or capsids that have been previously developed for ex vivo applications uh, ready to be redeployed in vitro or in vivo. Um, the variants in these two buckets exhibit a wide range of diversity in their tissue tropism. So there are capsids here that exhibit uh, uh, targeting to the CNS, to the muscle, to the liver, uh, to the heart, uh, and even to T cells. Uh, we'll talk about two of these capsids today as, uh, as individual case studies. So Strive 5 up there on the top left uh, is a CNS capsid with enhanced cell type specificity. Uh, and Strive 47, two below that, is a pantropic capsid uh, that is, exhibits enhanced potency. Uh, the last bucket on the right uh, is made up of all of these capsid libraries that I was talking about before um, and any pre-existing evolutionary tissues from Stride Bios programs. Um, so as I said, when we think about the future of capsid engineering at Ginkgo, this is really what excites us the most. Uh, this collection represents the largest well of sort of un untapped potential uh, and contains variants that are re ready for discovery and deployment. Um, Stride Bio's application of structural knowledge allowed for the engineering of these capsids, and it's really in this space that we hope to use the teachings of capsid engineering and the capsids that resulted from it to unlock the next generation of AAVs as we start to treat these different functional areas that we've uh, started to see as puzzle pieces to build the next generation of capsids. Uh, so with that, I want to start out talking about uh, sort of our first case study here, and, uh, the, and, and in doing so, highlight Strive 5. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so this is a capsid that's ready to deploy for partners. Uh, and, and really, when I say case study, I think it's a good example of uh, how we're viewing capsid functionality as building blocks uh, at Ginkgo. Uh, this capsid specifically has been extensively vetted for its biodistribution and expression in pigs, uh, in mice, and in NHPs. Uh, and it was selected for its cell type specificity, uh, liver targeting, and its manufacturability. Uh, the data we're going to go over today was actually discussed at ASGCT 2022, and it highlights each one of these individual functionalities. So first up, we've got uh, uh, Stry5 uh, and its cell type specificity. So actually during the development of this capsid, one of the first things that was noted uh, that with direct administration to the CSF and mice, you get really good spread across the brain. Um, and some first early indications of its liberty targeting character, but Stry5's flagship experiment is really what you're seeing here before you, which is the uh, delivery into I, uh, via ICM into NHPs. Uh, and this is where we first saw its ability to not only broadly target the CNS, um, but to specifically target neurons over astrocytes. Uh, so starting on the left, you can see some increased M-cherry expression uh, when we compare Stry5 to AAV9, especially in the hippocampus. Um, and when we take a look at the, the numbers for this, when we actually quantify it, um, when we look at vector genome copy numbers in the CNS, they're actually similar to AAV9, but with increased transduction in the form of mRNA expression and protein production, as you see here on this slide, uh, uh, as characterized by m cherry ELISA. So looking at places like the premotor cortex and the cerebellum, uh, you can see that per vector genome copy number, uh, we've got more protein that is produced. And, and this is what we're really talking about when we're thinking about the potency aspect. Uh, that's a, a feature of a lot of these strive capsids. Um, moving all the way to the right, as I mentioned previously, when we, when we go in and we actually analyze these cell types uh, that are transduced by the capsid, uh, we see that it exhibits a, a specificity for neurons, specifically over astrocytes. Uh, shown here by new N and M cherry co staining. Uh, so all in all, we're viewing this capsid as a, a great CNS capsid for CNS applications, delivered ICM if you want to specifically hit neurons uh, with enhanced potency. Uh, so next up is Stry5's liver targeting character. As I mentioned early in the development cycle, it was noted that the capsid had uh, decreased copy numbers and protein expression after direct CSF dosing or IV dosing in mice. Uh, and, and, and in NHPs, 
Uh, the capsids exhibited up to a thousand fold lower transduction by vector copy number. And you can see on here the right, uh, the results of that actually when we look at M. cherry uh, ELISA um, in the liver, where we see a lot more, uh, a lot less protein production um, compared to its parental AAV9. And, and on the left, that's also, uh, there's another snapshot of that that I feel like is a very glaring, obvious uh, a comparison here, um, where STRI5 is a, a lot less M. cherry produced in the, in the liver compared to AAV9. Um, so this sort of combination of the higher potency that I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, combined with lower transduction uh, in the liver is exactly the type of safety improvement we're trying to unlock uh, and layer uh, onto the next generation of capsids as we sort of refine the work that was done at Strive Bio. Um, this would allow us to begin to understanding which modifications lend themselves to which specific character, which we've actually already started to do with Strive 5, um, and then position those unique characteristics on new capsids. Uh, so the last bit for Strive 5 here is manufacturability. Um, this is obviously a concern with uh, all AAVs, everyone's gene therapy product here. Um, and, and one thing I want to highlight is that uh, during the library creation process, during this early screening process, uh, manufacturability is uh, early, it's integrated very early uh, into this pipeline. Um, so the idea here is that you try and ensure scalability after candidate selection. Um, but then, of course, after rounds of selection, we go through repeat processes of test, uh, processes of testing manufacturability uh, again. So this capsid specifically been manufactured with over 10 transgenes uh, produced at various scales. Uh, and we're able to produce high purity vector with this capsid from R&D to GMP. Um, and to date, to date, this capsid has been produced at scales, scales well over what's uh, sort of the, uh, the, the desired number, at least the floor, uh, for a new AAV capsid, 1E13 VG per liter. Cool. So that's the last bit on Strive 5. I want to jump next to uh, uh, the, this new capsid, Strive 47. Um, uh, highlighting this as a, a pantropic capsid um, and really hitting on some of the kidney data that was shared at ASGCT last year. Um, uh, I, the three different sort of aspects of this capsid that I'm going to highlight today are one, this cross-species evolution uh, process that we go through, uh, the enhanced potency again, where Strive 47 really excels uh, at, at displaying this, uh, and then sort of the expanded tropism uh, of the capsid itself, filling a void that used to exist for uh, the kidney in regards to AAV capsid tropism. Uh, there's actually a lot more data coming out uh, on this capsid at ASGCT this year, um, with more information on the way uh, on its proximal tubule targeting characteristics. Um, so to jump right into the, the first piece here, uh, the cross-species aspect. Uh, this capsid was originally developed in the lab of Dr. Arvind Asokin at Duke University as a CNS-targeted capsid, uh, and this was done through the cross-species approach, specifically in the order pig, mouse, and monkey. Um, and when you look at bubble plots like this, the way that what we're really trying to represent here is uh, the enrichment as you move from step to step, from species to species. Uh, so in short, the higher the bubble is, uh, the largest percent of the population a given sequence is. So one bubble is, is correlates to one sequence. Uh, and the size of the bubble tells you uh, how much enrichment, the fold enrichment you get from species to species. So if we focus on monkey at the very end, you can see CC47, STRI47 is uh, a very high percent of reads. So it's a large portion of the population and a larger bubble size than say the gray dot that you see just below it which is AAV9, there's a massive fold change when you move from mouse to monkey. Um, so this capsid was initially, uh, as I said, sort of picked up as a, uh, a picked up as a CNS capsid, but through testing, uh, it became apparent that it has a whole variety of other things going on. Um, this specific cross-species evolution pattern has been used very frequently with all, or been used typically with all new development projects, basically since the advent of Strive 47 in order to try and unlock similar characteristics. Uh, so a lot of data on this slide, but I really want to show you, uh, uh, I want to try and get across sort of the immediate glaring trend uh, that the lab highlighted uh, when they started doing these experiments in, in, in mice, which is uh, Strive 47 produces more protein than AAV9 uh, across all the tissues that, that it gets into. Um, so uh, again, we're reviewing this capsid as pantropic because uh, we have uh, tissues where you have high transduction, 
uh, that include the heart, the muscle, the CNS, the liver, and of course the kidney. Um, some of the data you can show here, where you, uh, is shown here, where you see the relative fold differences in transduction by M cherry fluorescence. Uh, IV experiments in NHPs indicate that this potency phenotype, so similar copy number, more protein, uh, actually translates especially uh, 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 translates well into NHPs, uh, especially in the muscle and in the kidney. Uh, the latter of which we'll jump into in just a moment. Uh, so one thing to note too is that this capsid crosses the blood-brain barrier in mice uh, and NHPs at levels comparable to AAV9. Um, and when delivered ICM especially, we see enhanced expression uh, in the CNS and systemically. So shown here is uh, cortex and cerebellum and heart, AAV9 versus Strife 47. Uh, overall, the capsid exhibits a similar biodistribution to AAV9, but again, with greatly increased protein expression. Uh, so we think Strive 47 is really well positioned for coupling with a partner's targeted, targeted approach, um, so say a direct route of administration, but especially when paired with Ginkgo's payload engineering uh, platform, uh, which Kaylee Carpenter is going to talk to you about here in just a second, as soon as I'm done rambling about capsids. Um, so sort of moving on to the next, uh, uh, the next feature of the capsid itself, um, this idea of expanded tropism, right? Trying to fill the void of, of kidney. Um, this unique expression profile has really been the star of the show among the Strive capsids. Uh, the data in this section was shared by Alan Rosales in, at ASGCT 2022. Um, and, and details here are on the early characterization efforts uh, with the capsid in mice. So when, when delivered IV, it was noted that the capsid exhibits robust expression uh, with either single-stranded or self-complementary reporter cassettes uh, in the kidney. And you can see that early data here, uh, where we see a 16-fold increase in total fluorescence using a self-complementary and cherry cassette. So again, a very striking phenotype uh, when compared to the, uh, the, the parental capsid. Uh, additional work on here was uh, was done to try and understand localization, uh, and, and this led to the identification or, or the exhibit of nearly a 100-fold increase uh, in M-cherry, again, by total fluorescence in the proximal tubules, um, shown here by co-staining for LTL. And so uh, the capsid labels are missing here, but on the top, you've got AAV9 across, you can see lower M-cherry expression than Strive 47 on the bottom, um, much higher expression in the, uh, uh, the proximal tubules by co -stain. Uh, so to sort of dig deeper into this and explore it further, uh, the Asokan lab carried out IV testing in an AI9 mouse model where uh, this is a Cree model where active recombinase leads to TD tomato expression in transduced cells. Uh, and this work included testing with both single-stranded and self-complementary vectors, packaging Cree recombinase driven by a CMV report uh, promoter. And you can see uh, at the top and bottom respectively, uh, that's what those, those constructs are. It was here that they confirmed expression in both the proximal tubules and the glomeruli of the mouse kidney. Um, and additional localiz co-localization experiments were done that I'm, I'm not going to show today uh, using a mark the marker synaptopodin uh, to confirm Strive 47's increased transduction in the glomeruli, especially, uh, especially when packed with the self-comp Cree cassettes. So the last bit of data here is, is as it pertains to the NHP. This was carried out at Stride Bio. Uh, this is a, a high dose study uh, carried out with the Strive 47 capsid delivering uh, Strive 47 IV to NHPs. Uh, and as you can see here on the GFP IHC, uh, there's higher protein expression across the kidney compared to AAV9, um, especially out into the interstitium. Uh, and then when quantified, the levels of the vector copy number here, although comparable between the two capsids, uh, there's over a two-fold higher GFP expression in the kidney overall uh, by protein ELISA. Uh, so this, this next set of characterizations is the next step towards really understanding what this capsid is able to do in this organ. Uh, and, and again, I think when paired with the right regulation, this can really lead to a potent kidney gene therapy vector. And uh, I'll ask Jake to time uh, time check me here because otherwise I'll talk forever. But uh, um, I, I wanted to give you sort of an overview on uh, uh, exactly what this these buckets of capsids look like um, and, and how we're thinking about the targeting associated with them. So again, extensively validated here on the left, uh, you can see where each of these capsids are going and where we're thinking about them from a targeting perspective. Uh, and early validation here on the right, uh, we have a variety of capsids with an early indication of where they can go and where they can perform. Um, and you know, all of these are available for, for testing with the, with the right client looking to do uh, head after an indication associated with it. Cool. 
Uh, the last piece that I want to leave you guys with today is an example of a Strive Capsid in action in a program. Uh, so as part of the Stride Bio acquisition, Ginkgo is, uh, now has access to the Strix 300 ARVC preclinical asset. This is available for license or for sale. Uh, this program includes a mountain of work carried out by my, by my colleagues at Stride Bio to develop a pre-IND stage cardio-selective AAV gene therapy product that has first-class potential uh, for the treatment of ARVC. Uh, Strive 84 exhibits potent cardiac transduction. It has liberty targeting characteristics similar to Strive 5. Uh, and the Stride Bio team combined this with a validated route of administration uh, and a cardiac-specific therapeutic cassette that has demonstrated rescue of murine disease models. Um, so we're really excited about data like this, and we're excited to expand our capsid engineering efforts here uh, at Ginkgo Bioworks. Uh, and we look forward to discussing how we can best apply any of these capsids or future capsids to best suit your needs or to work together to engineer the next best thing. Uh, and thank you guys for your time. All right. Thank you so much, Kenan. Thank you so much. All right. We're going to, I'm going to do some follow up QA uh, on that. That was really enjoyable. God, those, the microscopy is so beautiful. I love it. I love it. Just uh, like, just speaking from a marketing perspective, right? It's, it's like, yes, that's pretty good. That's good television. That's good television. Um, okay. Well, I, I want to do a few follow-up questions while I got you here. Okay. And in particular, I'd like to sort of pick your brain a little bit about just the, like the meta experience of AAV engineering. I know you've got a really deep experience in the area. You've been doing it for more than 10 years and all, like often with biology, people get this kind of an affinity or an intuition for a biological system that they've worked with for a really long time. There's like a feeling of the organism that you get. Okay. So I just, in the most general possible sense, I want to know what is it like to engineer AAV? What are the challenges? Uh, what is it like to do for bioengineers and what is it not like to do? Just share with me some, some intuitions that come from a, a long experience in this space. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. Um, I, I really like the question because I feel like it follows closely to something that Dr. Mavis McKenna would always say, which is that she doesn't feel like enough people respect the AAV capsid, right? Like it feels like it's important to like vibe check your capsid almost. Um, because there's so many cases where, you know, you can go out and you can do an engineering project uh, like Strive 47, where you're like, okay, this is going to hit CNS. It's going to be the perfect CNS capsid. And then you see some interesting phenotypes and you go and test it and it's not, but it's good for other things, right? So I feel like coming along with that is understanding that like, there's so many times where the data has to lead you in science. And that's definitely true for capsid discovery. The hope is that you can test as many things as humanly possible all the time, end up with as many candidates as you can, and at least one of them will be doing the thing that you want to do. But sometimes you end up with a capsid that does something completely different, and it's up to you to do the due diligence on, uh, on testing it for that specific application and chasing it down as much as you can. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is true for a lot of things in, in science, especially in the gene therapy space. But we want AAV to be as malleable as like small molecules, and we're, we're not there yet. We have to let it lead lead us by the hand a little bit first. Yeah, I like that. I like that. I um, how how did you put it? You got to respect the capsid, right? You got to you got to vibe check the the capsid. Right. I think I think that's right. I, so and that's that's sort of interesting um, in this particular context because it so it means that there there are going to be some AAV engineering projects that are that are that are goal directed. Right? You've got a, you've got a particular therapeutic target in mind and you've you've got to optimize for that application because that's that's what you're that's what you're going after. Um, but I do I think it suggests the possibility of maybe bringing in the Ginkgo foundry earlier early on in in the early stage r and d yep. process to get a little bit more exploratory um, and see where, where, where can the capsid lead you, right? What is, what is the, what is, what is AAV as a, as a vector? What does it, what does it excel at? Um, and, and sort of use that as the, as the foundation for your, for your project. Yeah. Yeah. I agreed. And there's this idea, uh, that we're, we're, you know, we're talking about today of multiplexing capabilities. And I feel like there's, there's a part of that that's, that's pure discovery, right? When we're, we're thinking about payload engineering, thinking about capsid discovery, 
yes, we have a target in mind, but everything we learn along the way is important. Things fall out of that that can lead to other, other things. Ginkgo is good at taking all of those pieces and sticking them all together at once and screening them uh, through a high throughput method. Um, so if you end up with a capsid like Strive 47 that is, you know, pantropic, goes to a lot of places, but excels, you'd want to pair that with something like payload engineering. And screening it at the same time is an advantage because you're not just, you know, bookending the work. It's just all happening in one go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So, I, okay, I have a follow-up question on the topic of scale. Right. On the topic of scale. So Ginkgo, we like to think big. And we know that for some biology problems, scale can be a, an unlock. Scale is a big unlock. Yeah. So my question is, where are the opportunities for scale in capsid engineering? What can we do with a big data set and a lot of automation infrastructure that we couldn't do before? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. I think, you know, when, when we think about capsid production, there's opportunity for scale there. It's something that, that, that Ginkgo is currently working on, right? We want to be able to, we do a lot of work in sort of arrays, right? We make, make a bunch of libraries of X thing all at the same time. Uh, there's a way to unlock that for capsid production, which then leads to uh, unlocking it for capsid testing that I think is the next big thing that we wanna be moving into, right? So taking some of these libraries and producing instead of what I'm used to doing, picking the top 10, making them in you know single flasks and then testing them, uh, making the top thousand as fast as possible so that you can bring them not just for in vitro applications, but kick that scale up so you can be doing it for in vivo applications. Uh, and I, I think that's really the key piece where, where you're, you're giving each capsid its time in the sun it's just that it's a thousand different caps. It's all in the sun at once instead of 10. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I like this. I like top 10 top. Psh, that's nothing. That's right. nothing. Right. Top. We're top. We're top. We're thinking top thousand now. I like, I like that a lot. So, okay. I'm going to, now I'm going to ask a question. Te technical people, they always hate it when I ask this question, I'm going to do it anyway. Is there, is there a magic number? Is there a, ma is there a magic number when it comes to scale and capsid engineering? Yeah. Is there like, it, it, is it, is it a thousand? Is it ten thousand? Like, when is the the sort of the number of of experiments, the number of capsid designs that you can test? What like wh where's that where's that sweet spot where you where you get that kind of an emergent property and all of a sudden you're engineering in a in a um, qualitatively different way? Yeah, no, it's it's a good question. I feel like this. Uh... <laughs> This obviously comes a lot. I also hate this question, but um, uh, is it a thousand? Just say a right. thousand. Yeah. Can you? <laughs> it's exactly a thousand, <laughs> no matter what the experiment is. Um, yeah, I think there's 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 an idea here of like you can either keep chasing for for gold, right, uh, uh, for infinity, and then you will find something. But in science, especially in in science, especially right, there's this idea of not letting uh, 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 perfect to be the en enemy of good enough, or even perfect being the enemy of great. Um, and so you can always keep doing more experiments. You can always keep looking for more capsids. The, the process should de-risk how many things you have to test, right? You could test a thousand capsids all ranked by like what you think is a measure of how good they're going to be. And the thousandth capsid might be the thing, right? And so it's up to you to figure out how to capture that breadth and the time that you have, the resources you have. And what we have to do at Ginkgo, and Ginkgo has shown it's been able to do in the past, is make that space bigger, make the size of the experiment bigger while doing one experiment, right? So Jake, you know, the question is, do you do 100 experiments with 10 capsids or do you one experiment with 1,000 capsids, right? Mm -hmm. So making that number as big as you can while testing in a smaller time scale, fewer resources is the idea. Yeah, that's right. I want the big one. That's what right. I want. Right. That's what big I want. Numbers sound better. They, I, th I think so. Okay, now, okay, I have to ask. I have to one more. I got, give me, give me one more. This is the question, right? This is the big one. Everybody in biotech, they want to know it. They're asking it about everything. And I'm bringing it bringing it back because honestly, like it's, it, it is that important. Amazing. You know it, you love it. I'm talking about machine learning, machine learning. Whenever I see big data, it's coming up against a complex problem, structural biology. Yeah. I have to think about machine learning. What are we doing with machine learning? What's the role for machine learning in AAV engineering going forward? 
Yeah, no, I, I used to hate this question too. So I retract what I said previously about your last question. This one's worse. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it's it's a reality, like, as you said, right? Like there, there are whole companies that are built upon this idea of using machine learning to drive captive engineering, right? So uh, Ginkgo has experience in the space and the way that we are trying to think about it as it relates to this data is connecting the dots between uh, in vivo readouts, real performance on these individual capsids, whether it's liver targeting, potency, right, cell type specificity, understanding what about the modifications on that capsid lead to that, and then tying it back to a mountain of data, right? So the library that Strive 47 came from, theoretically, given enough time and enough data, you can go in there and you can test a bunch of those capsids, uh, see, check, you know, look at the potency for all of them, right, or Strive 5, look at all the ones that have liberty targeting and use machine learning to understand what the pattern is. Uh, I, I used to say, I feel like this, this thing at Stride that, that sounds like I, I, it sounds like I'm saying nothing, but I know what I, what I'm thinking here is that structural information is all just numbers, right? And we, we, we're narrowing down where we can make modifications and what those modifications do. Machine learning exists to help us crunch that. So there's a connection there that we want to make so that we can understand that if we're dealing with all of this data, how we can better guide a capsid towards what we want it to do. Like we mentioned earlier, we'll just vibe check it earlier rather than, you know, when it's ready. Yeah, you got to, you got to. I'm, I definitely am noticing there's like a shift in the ecosystem where like, where before you'd, people would be like, okay, I want to give me the minimum number of ex experiments that I need to give me a viable product Right. is now give me a mountain of data, give yeah. me all of the data in the world because I want, I want it for machine learning. I yeah. want it. Yeah. Uh, Kenan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thanks for listening. Um, so now we've got some really sweet capsids. Let's say we've got some really, really good capsids. What are we going to put inside of them? It's time to talk about payload engineering. And for this, we will turn to Kaylee Carpenter. Kaylee has a chemical engineering degree from the University of Wisconsin and an MBA from Harvard. She's worked across the healthcare space for eight years, uh, notably at AbbVie before coming to Ginkgo. Welcome. Welcome, Kaylee. Thank you, Jake. And thank you, Kenan. Uh, tough to follow. Let me share my slide here, which also has that outdated photo of my face on it. <laughs> uh, it looks great. <laughs> But we can we can jump right in. So um, thanks again. Yes, I'm talking about payload engineering. Um, and as we mentioned, this is one excellent way to add some some new vibes, if you will, to use Kenneth's term to your capsids um, and an additional level of control and targeting to your gene therapy. Uh, and specifically, we're going to talk about regulatory elements. And I'll announce here today Ginkgo's new regulatory element screening platform. Regulatory elements, as, as I think you all know, are a critical piece of any gene therapy. They can provide cell type specificity and tune your expression, which thereby reduces side effects and immunogenicity and ultimately lower, lowers the COGS for your, your AAVs as well. Our platform provides actually direct readout of transcription across tens of thousands to millions of regulatory element candidates, enabling selection of the best tuned regulatory element for each of our partners' use cases. So you're probably wondering what exactly that means. Let's dive in a little bit. Ginkgo's platform for regulatory element screening uses a circular RNA as the transcriptional readout when screening a library of regulatory elements. So essentially we design and build these large libraries of enhancers, promoters, or some combination of both, which drive expression of an appropriately barcoded Cupid insert which encodes this proprietary hairpin ribozyme that's flanked by two additional ribozyme sequences. And for those wondering, Cupid stands for Custom Promoter Identification. Uh, and then when these barcoded libraries are introduced into cells of interest, the resulting barcoded transcription occurs, and the adjacent ribozymes liberate the barcode containing Cupid insert, uh, which then self-circularizes. And what we love about these circles is that they're highly stable, they're easy to separate and sequence. So we then sequence each barcoded circle to get a very quantitative readout that's appropriately normalized to the amount of DNA we delivered when we introduce the system into the cells. And then we're ultimately identifying the top, top performing regulatory elements for our partner's particular context. And so 
talk a little bit about what we mean when I say particular context. So we have a lot of flexibility in how we can design these libraries. We can um, combine elements, for example. We can build libraries of enhancers in combination with a minimal core promoter that our partner really likes, for example, that they're maybe already using, and they want to sort of boost their boost or tune their expression further. Uh, for the most part, these libraries consist of um, tens of thousands up to millions of DNA sequences that we identify from bioinformatic analysis of genomes, the literature, and past projects. And we identify those that we think are likely to have some propensity towards expression and regulation slash control. We then build these libraries, so physically build them, and we can build them into plasmids or viral vectors. Uh, the, the appropriate format we choose depends on the cell type and whether the screening will occur in tissue culture, organoid, or in an actual animal model directly. Uh, in the case of cell lines or primary cells, we can screen in our partner's tissues of interest. And then also, importantly, counter screen in tissues our partners are looking to detarget. Um, we can also look in an animal model at you know, more extensive expression and biodistribution data to, to determine performance across, across tissues. All right, so here is just one example of the results of such a screen. Uh, in this case, we were in a cell culture context. So here we were screening various enhancer elements upstream of a minimal core promoter that our, our partner really liked. So this, uh, this slide shows the top hits among a library of 50,000 elements in this case across various end uses. So we found enhancers that drove transcription in the lung but not in the liver, and similarly found enhancers that were strong in liver tissue and weak in lung. And so obviously, depending on what you're looking for, one of those kind of clusters would be more interesting than, than the other. Uh, our large scale high throughput approach is really important to highlight here. In each of these cases, each of these little clusters, we found roughly 10 to 15 elements of the 50,000, which met our partner specific criteria. And importantly, Ginkgo's expertise in developing barcoded libraries and our circular RNA reporter, which we love for this screen here, um, and its ability to enable this quantitative readout are what allowed us to find these uh, needles in the haystack, if you will, regulatory elements, which which showcase this, um, you know, Goldilocks balance of expression and targeting, again, in, in the particular context of our partner. Next slide here. So we are, we're very excited to run similar sorts of screens with you in your context. There are a lot of ways we can work together, whether through an animal model as discussed or a cell culture context. Generally speaking, we think of these screens as either off the shelf or custom. So we have an off the shelf library of 50,000 regulatory elements that we've sourced from human, NHP and mouse genomes, and that's ready to go for introduction into your cells of interest. Um, and we can get you primary screen data readout based on that library in as few as six weeks. So it's really a, a pretty quick and efficient experiment. We can also design a custom library for your context with either plasmid or viral vector design and here, any regulatory element is customizable within these libraries. So thanks very much. Uh, we're looking forward to discussing how better regulatory elements can support your projects and fine tune your capsids. Uh, thanks very much for your time. All right, Kaylee, thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was great. That was great. Um, I have some follow up questions. Uh, I want to go back. I want to get the double click on the Cupid system so that I can see everything. Okay, the Cupid system that you described for screening promoter activities, because I think it's a it's a really beautiful approach, but it's it's a bit counterintuitive. It's a so like for example, I didn't expect circular RNA to yeah. be involved in this process, right? I've thought, oh well, this is, we're going to be this is going to be DNA sequencing, right? Like this, this, we're packaging DNA in the capsid. I thought it would be a DNA reporter, right? But it's not. It's circular RNA. So can you walk me through again? How are we going from a promoter library to an AAV capsid to a construct that is expressing a circular RNA in an animal model, and how is that giving us? a readout on the promoter activity in specific tissues? Yes, lots of questions there, Jake. I will, I will address them all. Uh, yes, we, we really like this Cupid system. I think the first thing to highlight is that in this case, the circular RNA is used as a reporter. So we are not ultimately introducing circular RNA into our partner's gene therapies. 
it's purely used as a tool in this case to report out on these top performing regulatory elements. So yeah, as you mentioned how it works, we design our library of promoters, enhancers, whatever it may be, and we encode within that library this self-circularizing self -circularizing hairpin ribozyme sequence. Um, and within each of the, those the ribozyme elements is a barcode. And Ginkgo, you know, Ginkgo has a lot of barcoding capabilities, which I, I'm sure we'll discuss further. Um, but essentially, after we introduce the this Cupid library into cells, um, transcription occurs, hopefully lots of transcription occurs. And this ribozyme actually self cleaves from the RNA transcription product. We don't really care what the transcription product is, we just care that transcription happened in relation to the, the particular promoter or regulatory element of interest. After the cleaving of that of the transcription product, the RNA self-circularizes. And as a circle, it's very stable. We find circular RNA is, is more stable than other types of RNA, um, but it's also just a lot easier to separate among this sort of transcriptional soup, whether in a cell culture model or especially in an animal model. Uh, than maybe other other reporters, um, and from there we're we're really essentially counting the circles uh, per barcode to determine you know barcode mm. A is ten x stronger than barcode B is hundred x stronger than the control because we have that many more circles we're we're counting effectively. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, does that answer your question? It does. It does. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and with that. Uh, we are going to leave the payload engineering section of our program and proceed to the general Q&A section. And so for this, I would like once again to call your attention to, uh, uh, to that, that Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we're going to bring out the whole squad for this. Uh, we're bringing out the whole squad. We've got our technical presenters, Kenan and Kaylee. And we're also joined by Sid Kishore uh, from the BD team. And so between us, we've got the expertise, all your questions about AAV services for gene therapy from either the business angle or the technical angle. Let me, I'm gonna put us in squad view. Oh, there, oh, look at that. Look at this team, I love it. If you wanna know more about Strive Capsids, ask away. If you wanna know more about what it looks like to partner with Ginkgo, ask away. Um, and, uh, here we go. Let me, uh, let me look, take a look here and see what we've got. Uh, I think I, I saw one, people have been asking them throughout the presentation. I've got one here from the, um, uh, on the, on the business side. This was, I said, I think this is a good one for you. Uh, question is what is the business structure for Capsid licensing? What is the business structure for R and D collaborations? Yeah. Um, it's, it's something we've been thinking about a lot, Dick. Um, and great presentation, Ken and Kelly. I really enjoyed it. Um, so those are two broad buckets that we're thinking of, right? There's uh, the licensing of what we call our ready-to-go extensively validated capsules. So Kenan spoke about a couple of those, TriFi and 47. And then there's the research collaborations to further develop capsules in our libraries that exist. These have not been validated to the extent that, that some of the other ones are. Uh, for for the licensing, it's it's a pretty standard structure, really. If um, similar to what you see in sort of deals in the pharma space, so uh, an upfront licensing fee, and then there's milestones associated with uh, with clinical development and, and commercial milestones and and royalties on the back end. Similar with the research collaboration, um, there's a research fee associated with the development process, and then there's a there's a, a licensing fee to license the capsid and then the downstream milestones. The one sort of differentiating factor I would, I would add here for Ginkgo is that we're a pure platform company. We're not, we're not a platform company with a therapeutics pipeline of our own. So we're not trying to maximize the financials from one particular deal to fuel our therapeutics platform. What this translates to for our partners is more favorable financial terms and on, especially on the downstream side. So that's that's really interesting and I'm, I'm happy to talk more about this with, uh, with folks. Great, thanks. Um, okay, I've got one here about, about animal models. So this is, do, do you have access to, to NHPs, to non-human non primates? What, tell, tell, what, what, what do we do about animal models? Um, 
Uh, Kaylee, maybe that's one that one's for you. Sure. Yeah. So Ginkgo, we don't have a vivarium in house, but we do have various CROs we can contract with for both small and large animal models. And uh, these CROs are comfortable with the way we do these large barcoded, you know, rather gigantic pooled screens. So we have pro protocols that we've we've developed with them and um, sort of methods in place to be able to run screens in this typical ginkgo fashion within the animal model context. Got it, got it, got it. Um, okay, so related to that topic, have, have these capsids been used in the clinic? Yeah, I can I can definitely feel that one. So uh, the the capsule that's furthest along uh, towards the clinic is Strive eighty four. Uh, so as part of the ARVC program that that Ginkgo now has available, um, this was actually pushed through past pre IND. Uh, it's it's uh, ready ready to go into the next phase into IND materials available for that as well. Uh, but no capsules currently in the clinic. Hoping to get there. Okay. Um, another one here on the business side, um, uh, maybe you addressed this earlier, Sid, uh, what are the licensing terms for, for a ginkgo engineered plasmid and what kind of exclusivity can I get? Yeah, I think I, I started touching upon these points in, in my previous response, but, um, we're, we're a partner driven company and we work with our partners on what's important to them. So in terms of the licensing terms and the exclusivity, we'd work with you on what's important, ranging from um, exclusivity to an indication or to a specific gene target all the way to sort of non-exclusive. And each of these comes with their associated sort of financial terms based on the value that uh, that, that license is bringing. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's, it's a classic business, it depends answer, uh, but happy to chat more about this with, for specific applications. Yeah, it depends. On the, on the tech side and the business side, sometimes we got to say it depends. It's my job is to try to pin you down and, and make you not say it depends, but I rarely succeed. Um, oh, okay, here, so here's what I like to see. Here's what I like to see. What what capsids can I get right now? Talk, tell, yeah. tell us more about the, the capsids that we've we've got available off the shelf, ready to license. What can we what can we do right now? Yeah, we heard about a couple of them today already. Uh, Stripe 5, Stripe 47. Highly validated, ready to go for licensing. Also, I have a couple more, Strive 84, um, uh, which is a very potent cardiotropic and sienostropic capsid. Um, Canon can add some more color there. And then we have a big bucket of capsids in what are very close to being validated. They've been validated extensively in mice um, and can be very quickly validated in larger mammals and ready to license. And that can be either partner driven. Um, are ready for licensing with our partner then taking those capsules and validating them in large amounts. Those are sort of uh, what's ready to go right now. But then as, as Kenan mentioned during his talk, we have hundreds of tens to hundreds of thousands of, of capsules in these libraries that exist, that exist that we're very excited about combining the powers of Stripe platform with Kenko's platform. And that's that's really, uh, you know, where the magic lies. Cool, cool, great, thanks. Okay, uh, one last question in the interest of time. Uh, can I get a quick vibe check on the plasmids? Can we just go around the circle or is it, are we good vibes? Is it everybody, yeah, thumbs up, I'm seeing thumbs up. Yeah, okay, so answered that one. And with that, the time has come to wrap up this virtual event. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, some highlights, some take home messages. Biology is accelerating. Biology is big. We all know that the next gen gene therapies, they're out there. Ginkgo can help you find them. Ginkgo wants to be your CRO. We want to give you access to tech that you can't get anywhere else. And today that means Strive Capsids, Capsid Engineering, Payload Engineering, the power of Ginkgo's foundry to deliver automation at scale. Thanks so much to our team who came out today. Kenan, Kaylee, Sid. Your call to action today is gene therapy at ginkgobioworks.com. When you are ready to get on the foundry, operators are standing by. Put that half a billion dollars worth of foundry infrastructure to work on your gene therapy project. After this Zoom call ends, you will automatically, you're gonna get booped over to a little survey. This is the easiest way to let us know how to follow up with you. 
let us know if you're ready to start the conversation. Somebody from Ginkgo will reach out to you. And until next time, as we like to say around here, let's grow.